You're listening to Points Talk with the Travel Mom Squad, previously known as the Travel Hacking Mom Show. Follow the links in the show notes to stay up to date with what the Travel Mom Squad has been up to. Do travel hacking terms like Chase 524 and two-player mode sound like a foreign language to you? Don't worry, they did to us at first too. Today, we're going to share some of the basics of travel hacking along with common terms we use in the points and miles world. You'll be up to speed in no time. Welcome to the Travel Hacking Mom Show. We are three moms who've discovered how to leverage credit card welcome offers to get hundreds of thousands of dollars in travel expenses for nearly free. We've used credit card points and miles to take vacations to places like Hawaii, Paris, Greece, the Maldives, Italy, and so much more. And the best part? We each still have an 800 plus credit score. Imagine being able to book a vacation without having to check your bank account. It's totally possible and we're here to show you how. Hey, I'm Alex. And I'm Pam, also Alex's mom. And I'm Jess. We are Travel Hacking Moms. In today's episode, we are going back to the basics, the basics of travel hacking. So let's get started. The basics that we are going to cover today include, we're going to review what travel hacking is. We are going to talk about the different types of credit cards, the Chase 524 rule, two-player mode, annual fees, And one of the questions we get most frequently, whether we keep, cancel, or downgrade the cards that we've applied for. So just as a recap, what is travel hacking? Travel hacking in its most simple form is leveraging credit card welcome offers to rack up tons of points and miles and then turn around and redeem those points and miles for nearly free travel. So first, we are going to talk about the types of credit cards and Alex tell us all about it. Okay, so there are three main types of credit cards that we use for travel hacking. The first one is transferable points, the second are co-branded cards, and the last one is cash back cards. So I'm going to give you a little overview of each one of those. So transferable point cards, these are our absolute favorite. This includes things like the Chase Ultimate Rewards, Capital One Venture Miles, City Thank You Points, and Amex Membership Rewards. The reason that we love these points so much is when you earn these points, you can use them in so many different ways. You can transfer them, hence the name transferable points, to different hotel and airline partners. So you're not locked into just like one airline or one hotel that you can use your points with. So yeah, that's transferable point cards. They're just super, super flexible. That's why we like them the most. Secondly, we have co-branded cards. And co-branded cards are definitely not as flexible. They include cards like your United Explorer card, your Hyatt card, a Marriott card, Southwest card. They are cards that are branded between a bank and an airline and or a hotel. So not as much much flexibility. If you open a United card, you are only going to be able to use those points on the United website. So... Like I said, they're not as flexible, but you can get some really, really great sign-up bonuses with these cards. You can get some great benefits with these cards. If you're loyal to a particular hotel or airline, you for sure want to have a card with that hotel or airline. We have opened a lot of co-branded cards, and we really, really like them. So that's our next favorite after transferable point cards. Lastly, you have cash back cards, and we don't use cash back cards as often, or we don't open very many of them. The exception of the cash back cards that, well, the ones I should say that we love the most are the Chase Freedom cards and the Ink Business cards. So the Ink Business Cash and the Ink Business Unlimited are cash back cards. And the reason we like these cash back cards so much is because you can actually turn this cash back into Chase Ultimate Rewards. So that's kind of a brief overview. If either of you have anything you wanted to, did I miss anything? I think that people often think that, you know, if they fly United a lot or if they stay at Hyatt's a lot, then the default should be like, oh, then I need to open a United card or, oh, then I need to open a Hyatt card. When in reality, the cards that we're often recommending to beginners are the cards with the transferable points because, you have so many more options. Like if you open the Chase Sapphire Preferred, you could transfer those to United or Southwest or Hyatt. Like it just, it's kind of like that card is a Hyatt card and is a United card and is a Southwest card. And so it's like the best of both worlds because like you said, you're not locked in 
to one program the way you would be if you just got the Hyatt card. Yeah, that's a good point. I'm so glad you brought that up. The other thing I was thinking of when you said that is a lot of people think too, if I if I want Southwest points, I need to just use my Southwest card for all of my purchases, but you will earn more points on your everyday spend if you're using your Chase Ultimate Reward cards and then transferring those points to Southwest. The exception is if you're trying to earn the Southwest Companion Pass, then you want to use your Southwest card if you're trying to earn them through spend. But yeah, typically you'll even earn more points on your everyday purchases with the transferable point cards versus the co-branded card. Yeah, like I rarely use my co-branded cards unless I am staying at a Hyatt hotel, I'll use my Hyatt card. If I'm booking a United flight, I'll use my United card. But like pretty much outside of using them at their hotel or airline partner, I really don't even use those cards very much. Agreed. Okay, next up is Chase 524 rule and Pam. Let's hear what you got to say about it. Yeah, Chase 5 and 24 rule. If you get into travel hacking, you will hear about that over and over again. It's a huge rule. This is how it goes. Chase, which is one of the biggest issuers of credit cards, in fact, it probably issues some of our most favorite credit cards, will only approve you for one of their credit cards if you have not opened up more than five cards of any type in 24 months. Now, this sounds really crazy, and it's kind of hard for people to wrap their head around. So what counts on this? Everything counts. So when you've gone to Gap and you've signed up for their card, so you can send, save $20 or 20% on that $100 purchase, that's going to count as one of your five and 24 spots. So not a good idea. My husband went to Cabela's one time and came home and was so proud of himself. He said, hey, I saved $20 because I opened up a Cabela's card. And isn't that just awesome? And I could have killed him because that (laughs) took one of his five and 24 spots. And it did really nothing. He might have saved $30 or so. But that took a spot where I could have gotten a card where I could have gotten, you know, 50 or 60,000 points that would have been worth hundreds of dollars. So it's really important to keep that Chase 5 and 24 rule in mind. So because of this, we often recommend that people open up all the Chase cards they'd like to open up before they go on to the other cards because the other card issuers don't care. You know, once you, it's just Chase. Chase cares about this. But once you've opened up five cards of any type, they're not going to give you another chance at any of their cards until you go back under the five and 24. One of the good things is that business cards don't count for that. And so that's helpful. So you could actually, if you're at 4 and 24, you've got four credit cards and you want to open up something, but you want to keep a spot open for a Chase card in case a great offer comes up. The best idea is to open up a business card because that's not going to count towards your 5 and 24. Currently, my husband and I are both over 5 and 24. And in about, and that happens in your journey of travel hacking occasion. You'll go over, you'll go back down under, but we both will be under within 30 to 60 days. That doesn't mean I'm not applying for cards though. That Mm -hmm. means right now I'm only applying for business cards because that doesn't affect my Chase 5 and 24. So the Chase 5 and 24 rule is huge to remember because they have really, really good cards and you don't want to go over that 5 and 24 and not be able to be able to apply for one of their cards when a great offer comes up. Any other thoughts on that, girls? What do you use to track your 524 status? Absolutely. The Travel Freely app. It is amazing. I will put a link to it in the show notes and I look at it still all the time. I know. I do the same and I used to have a note in my iPhone when I first started and now things have gotten much easier because I'm not having to do the math in my head to try and figure out when... I'm going to be under 524 again. My husband and I are actually both going to be under 524 in a week. So Ooh, I'm nice. excited. I I'm know. going to be under in a week too. 
Oh, we're, we are all over crazy. Yeah. My husband is not over though. I usually try to keep one of us under so then we can kind of take advantage of those good offers when they come. One thing you said though, mom, that kind of made me think of something when you were talking was about business cards and how they don't count towards your 524. And in my, and I think we would all agree business cards are a huge part of our strategy and make it so that when we are over 524, it's not like we all of a sudden have to stop applying for credit cards. That's how we are able to get so many points is because we make business cards a part of our strategy. And so I just want to encourage people to not write off business cards if you don't think you have a business. There's a lot of ways you can qualify for business cards. You don't need to have like some giant corporation. You don't even need a business license. So we'll put a link in the show notes too for our blog post about how to qualify for business cards because it can kind of take that your travel hacking to the next level. And Alex, isn't there a couple business cards that do not, that do count against your five and 24? Yeah. So Capital One and TD Bank are the ones that I've heard that will count towards your 524. They're also not like the most popular ones. So, you know, most people aren't jumping out of the gates to rush off to get those ones. Exactly. Okay. So next up, let's talk about two-player mode. All right. Two-player mode is huge. Two-player mode is where you have someone who is right alongside you applying for cards to basically double all the sign-up bonuses that you're getting. It does not have to be a spouse. It can be um, a friend, a family member. You can have more than one. You can have player three, player four. You know, I'm sure Pam and Alex sometimes use themselves as their player threes, you know, with their strategy of applying for cards to go on trips together. And I, my dad, so it's like a player four. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, and I do that too. Like, so my husband is my player two, but like my best friend and I just went to Greece. She was technically my player three in that situation because I was like, apply for this card. You can transfer the points to me. I'll book our hotel. And then you can and, refer each other to. Yes. And so it does not have to be a spouse. So that's what people, people will message us and say, I want to do this, but I'm not married. And I'm like, that's fine. Like maybe you have a different travel companion or like your sister or, you know, just whoever is traveling with you is your player two. And so... It can get tricky if your player two is skeptical, like my husband was. He jokes that when I first told him about travel hacking and we started opening credit cards, he would hear sirens and a police car behind him and he would think they were coming to arrest him for travel hacking and opening credit cards. And I had to reassure him that they weren't and that it was not illegal and we were not going to be, be arrested. And I'm like, see, we've been doing this seven years. We're, we're not in jail yet, so it's fine. But if they are skeptical, I usually tell people, like, be patient with them, try to explain it to them in terms that they can understand, offer to be the one to basically take over the management of the cards and the points and the bookings. Like, even my friend who went to Greece with me, she's not skeptical, but she just doesn't have time to do all this. And so I basically told her, here's the card you need to open. Here's how you transfer them to me. Once they're transferred to me, I will handle everything else, you know, so just make it as easy as possible for them. And then once you start taking them on the free trips, they will become addicted just like you are. And so it's kind of like once they see the proof that it really does work and it's legit, it's not a scam, it's not too good to be true, then they will be more involved and it'll be easier to get them, you know, on board for future trips. And then as far as why why it's important is... Like we've said, you're basically doubling the number of points you're getting from welcome offers, but you're also getting referral points along the way for referring them for cards. So let's take the Chase Sapphire Preferred, for example. The standard offer on that card is 60,000 Ultimate Rewards points after you spend $4,000 in three months. So if I just applied for that card by myself, cool, I have 60,000 points. Now let's say my husband applied for that card. He gets 60,000 points. Cool. We have 120,000 points. But let's say I refer him. I get 15,000 referral points in addition to the 60,000 he gets. So now we have 135,000 Chase Ultimate Rewards points. So we went from having 60,000 Chase points when it was just me by myself to 135,000 Chase points when it was the both of us, which right there is enough for a week at a five-star resort in Hawaii. So... 
that is really why having a player two can really like level up your travel hacking game and get you those free vacations way quicker than just trying to do it by yourself. I have a question for you. Go ahead, Alex. Do you make your spouse an authorized user? No. Okay. Tell, tell us about that and how that applies to 524. Yeah. So technic. Okay. Let's say in the scenario I just went through with the Chase Ultimate Rewards points that I had made my husband an authorized user on my account when I applied. That Okay, it does not technically count towards my husband's 524 status, but Chase's system cannot differentiate between a primary card holder and an authorized user. And so as far as their system goes, it counts as if he had, that counts as an account for his 524 status. So it is much easier and you can, if you were to apply for a card and Chase denied you and it's because you were over 524 because you're an authorized user on someone's card, you can call them and ask them to overlook it, but it's just a pain. And I try to just avoid calling the banks if at all possible. Especially and, your player too. Like if they're hesitant, they're not going to want to have to call the banks. <laughs> yeah. Like my husband and my husband would be like, uh, I'm not calling Chase. No way. So it's easier from the get go just to not even deal with that. And so my husband and I do not add each other as authorized users on cards for that reason. Now, if I added him as an authorized user, he still could get his own card. But again, it's just easier from the get-go to not add one another as authorized users. I was just going to say that I have the best player too because he doesn't like to travel as much. So I get to use a lot of his points too. So, But he does, he is totally on board with doing this and he loves it because when he does travel, he's always saying, I do get to sit in business class, don't I? And he does, but I get a, to use a lot of his points too. So perfect yeah. player too. I really, I really think that's the best way to get your skeptical player two on board is to take on everything and just say, okay, I'm going to do it. And then take them on a trip. If you really want to be mean, you could book yourself in business and them in economy and be like, oh, darn, you didn't want to. I thought you weren't into the travel hacking stuff. Next time you can open a car too and you can sit in business with me. No, I'm just kidding. But you should have them sit in business with you because then they'll really be hooked. The problem is now like the luxury, the business class and the five-star hotels and resorts is like all my husband wants to do. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm like, okay, we can't have every trip like that. We have to kind of, you know, pace ourselves so that we can maintain some points for other things. Exactly. Okay. We're going to get into annual fees and people hate annual fees and travel hacking when they get started. And they're always saying, well, I want a card that doesn't have an annual fee. So our favorite card that Chase Sapphire preferred for beginners has an annual fee of $95. But you're going to earn 60000 ultimate rewards. And that is worth $750. And I can never figure out, I mean, if someone offered me $750 and I only had to pay them $95, I'd say, sign me up every day of the week, 365 days a year. I mean, it's such a good deal. And so the banks have to get something out of this. They are giving us such incredible points and miles to use that it's very little for us to pay. And most of the time when we're paying these annual fees, we also get benefits. Like there's great travel benefits, insurance benefits with the Chase Sapphire card, really primary uh, rental car insurance. So just really good uh, travel benefits. And so it's often worth it to keep paying for the cards, even after you get those points. Case in point, I live near Denver. And so that's my uh, airport I usually travel out of. Uh, the United United is a hub, and so I travel United Airlines a lot. Uh, my United Explorer card, again, that's a co-branded card, has a fee of $95 a year. That card gets me priority boarding. It gets me two lounge airport lounge passes. Now, I'm not crazy about the United lounges, but once in a while, that's the only lounge I can go to, and so I do use those two every year. And it gets me a free, free luggage. 
And there's lots of times I don't want to do carry on luggage. And so free luggage. So if I do that a couple times a year, if I use my lounge passes, which just that in itself is worth $95, those two lounge passes and the priority boarding, absolutely worth my $95. So annual fees. Oh, you also, mom, though, with that card, get TSA pre-check or global entry every, f- right. every few years. So right. that's so another actually, perk. Actually, it's a win-win. I'm making money on them by paying that annual fee. And so always, 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 that first year that you get a card, it is worth paying the annual fee for the the points or miles that you're going to get. And often it's worth paying the annual fee every year thereafter because of the benefits you get. Mom, that is the perfect segue into our next section on keeping cards. So a lot of people ask us, you've, you've opened these cards, like and they have high annual fees. What do you do? Do you keep them all every year and pay that annual fee again and again? And if you have so many cards, that's a lot of annual fees. How do you manage that? How do you, do you cancel some of these cards or, or what do you do? So we're going to go through the process and how we manage all these cards that we have. The first option you have is to keep your credit cards. So you have to decide for yourself if the benefits that come with that card are worth more than the annual fee. The idea is that like you should be making money on these annual fee cards. And if you're not, if you're not coming out ahead, then it's probably a sign that that's not a card that you need to keep year in, year out. So the next step would be to look to downgrade your card. So if you decide, okay, I have this card. It's not really serving me. It was great for the first year when I got that big bonus, but I don't want to pay the annual fee still. You'll look to downgrade it. So this means you call the bank and you ask them to switch your current card to a different card with either a lower or a no annual fee. And they can help you know like which card you could switch to or what your options are. Some cards though don't have an option to downgrade to. So just be aware of that. But if you downgrade, the benefit of it is, is you're not gonna have a closed card on your account. You will keep that same credit line open and it just looks better on your credit history than having a bunch of cards opened and a bunch of cards closed. So we try to downgrade more often than we cancel our cards. That being said, sometimes, like I said, there's not an option to downgrade. Or maybe you want to get the bonus on a card again. And to get that bonus, you need to cancel. You can't currently have that card. And so when the last scenario would be to cancel your card. So I will cancel a card if the benefits aren't worth it. There's not an option to downgrade it to. And an example of that would be like my American Airlines cards. I don't fly American Airlines very often. Getting a free check back with them is not helpful since I don't really fly them. And so I will just cancel that card and get rid of it because it doesn't do me any good and there's not an option to downgrade to. One thing I want to say though before you downgrade a card or before you cancel a card is to call the bank or with American Express it's even better because you can just chat and you can ask them for a retention offer. So a retention offer is where they offer you points or they waive your annual fee in exchange for you keeping the card. And so we've had a lot of success with this more so I would say with American Express than other banks. But for example, I have the American Express Bonvoy business card and the annual fee on that is $125. And I was able to get a retention offer for 30,000 points. And so that to me, those 30,000 points were worth more than $125. Plus that card comes with a free night every year. So I opted to keep the card and get that retention offer. So how about each of us? Can you guys give me an example of a card that you have kept that you find the value, more value in in the benefits of the card than the fee? Hey, before we do that, I wanted to bring up something that we haven't talked about. And is that is that we always, we don't do anything until we've had a card for oh, a year. Perfect. Thank you. I meant to bring that up. <laughs> so we always keep all of our cards for a year. And when that fee posts, then we decide whether we're going to keep, downgrade, or cancel it. And that's because it l- looks good 
for our business with the credit card companies. And also, if you were to have especially American Express membership rewards, they can actually claw back or take back those points from you if you haven't spent them. And so we wait till it posts. We've got 30 days to decide what we're going to do. Once we make a decision to do something besides keep it, um, then they will credit that annual fee back. And so that's a really important thing to remember. Okay, keeping a card. One that I always keep, I already told you about my United Explorer, but I also keep my uh, Marriott, I keep my hotel card. Well, I was hoping you were going to say your platinum card, Mom, because that's kind of a shock, shocking one because that's such oh, a high. you're right. It is. It is. That is the most shocking one. I've got to say that when you're right. So the American Express Platinum card is a card that most people won't even get. And I keep it year after year. I will always have it. If I was to say my favorite card, shockingly, I would probably say that card. That card has an annual fee over $600. Is it $695, you guys? I'm yes, guessing on it. Yeah. So, so talk about annual fee shock. Most people are like, there's no way I do that. And I'm not going to go through all the benefits of it. And But I will tell you that I get probably about $1,100 worth of benefits with that card alone because I use the benefits. If you don't use the benefits, it's not worth it. It's worth it for sure that first year because usually you get 100,000 plus American Express membership rewards um, with a sign up for that. But I keep it for ever because it works for me. And I'm, as I've said, as you'll hear, a huge airport lounge geek, and nobody has better airport lounge um, access than the um, American Express Platinum Card. And so that's one of the reasons why I always keep it. All right, I will go next. I will always keep my Chase Sapphire Preferred Card. And that is because it has a $95 annual fee, It comes with a $50 hotel credit every year if you book a hotel through the Chase Travel Portal. I am going to spend at least $50 on a hotel in a year. So that right there effectively brings the annual fee down to $45. And you have to have one of the Chase premium cards. And by premium, it just means one of the cards that has an annual fee in order to be able to transfer your Chase points out to transfer partners like United or Southwest or Hyatt. So it is more than worth $45 a year for me to be able to transfer all of my Chase points out to Hyatt because I get so much value out of my Hyatt redemptions. So the Sapphire Preferred is one that I will always, always, always have in my wallet. Okay, I... It's really hard for me to choose one, so I'm going to choose two. Um... Like Jess said, I will keep my Sapphire Preferred forever. Um, The other one, though, that I will continue to pay the annual fee on is my Venture X card. It has a $395 annual fee, but it comes with a $300 travel credit each year in the Capital One portal. It has a 10,000-point anniversary bonus every year, and that alone is worth at least $100. So right there, I'm at $400 in the annual. So, you know, almost over the annual fee and benefits. And it also has, it has a bunch of benefits, but the next one that I love so much is their lounge access. They have access to Capital One lounges, which they only has one so far in Dallas, but they're opening up more. But with that, you also get lounge access to Priority Pass lounges, and you get the restaurant benefit where there's select airport restaurants where you and one guest can get, what is it? Is it 20? $28. Oh yes. $28 per person. So that's really great. And the other reason I love that card for the lounge access is you can bring in two guests for free. You can add an authorized user for free and they can also bring in two guests. So it's a really good card for families to be able to have airport lounge access. I also will keep my Hyatt card because I love the free night that comes with the Hyatt card. I have got so much good value out of the free night certificate that comes with that card. I have like other hotel cards like Marriott and IHG and the Hyatt free night certificate to me, I can use it at a lot nicer places it's just I don't know I just like those hotels for my free night certificate more than my other credit card options okay so I already shared a card that I have canceled I shared an American Airlines card do you guys have one that you can share that you've canceled and why you've canceled it I have canceled my Southwest cards in the past 
after the year just because I got the companion pass, I got the points, and at the time I didn't really see the need to keep it open. I will say that like they've really improved the benefits of the Southwest business card in particular. And so that is one that I'm planning to apply for this year and I could see keeping that one going forward. But yeah, I have definitely canceled my Southwest cards because there's no, it's like a lot of the co-branded cards don't have a downgrade option. And so if there were, if there was a, you know, a fee free Southwest card that I could downgrade to, I would have done that, but there wasn't. And so I just canceled them outright. I have done the same thing with my Southwest cards. And it's an important strategy too, if you want to keep getting the companion pass, right? you will have to cancel those cards to then reapply for them 24 months from when you last got your bonus. Okay, mom, what about you? I too, I've um, opened up a co-branded airline card, the uh, Delta American Express uh, Delta Gold card and canceled it. I was interested in getting the uh, miles, but it didn't really work for me because I don't fly on it a lot. And so I didn't want to pay the fee again. So I just canceled it. And I don't cancel very many. I don't think any of us cancel very many, but once in a while, you know, it's the thing to do. What's one you guys have downgraded? I never have. <laughs> I don't know why. Pam hasn't. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I, I love paying annual fees. I know. Pam You're just really good at maximizing those benefits. That's right. <laughs> um, I actually downgraded my, I am not I'm not as big of an Amex Platinum cheerleader as Pam is. And so I actually downgraded my Amex Platinum earlier this year to an Amex Gold card. And it is important to note that I have had the Gold card in the past. And so I've already gotten that welcome offer. If I hadn't had the Gold card in the past and I downgraded it, that would prevent me from getting the sign up bonus on the gold card. So I would never downgrade to the gold card if I hadn't had it before, but I have had it before. I actually had it. And then I got an upgrade offer to upgrade to the platinum. And so I did that. And then when my platinum annual fee hit again, I was like, nope, I'm not paying $695. And so I downgraded it back to the gold. So that's pretty good. That's a good story. (laughs) I have downgraded my United Explorer card They actually do have a United no annual fee card. I believe it's called the Gateway card. Is that still? I have that one too. So, (laughs) and that is really an important card for me to have because if you have any United credit card, you get more access to award flights just for being a card holder. Like when I'm searching, it'll say, this is a special flight available to you as a mileage plus card holder. And so I always want to have a United card because I do fly them you know, fairly often, a couple times a year usually. And so I love having that benefit just for having the no annual fee card. Yeah, that's a great benefit. All right. So I think that that is a wrap on episode three. And those are just some of the travel hacking basics. We will be covering more about each of these in future episodes. Like honestly, each of those basics could have its own episode dedicated to it. We kind of just tried to do a big picture overview of them. So hope you enjoyed that. And we will definitely be sharing more in future episodes. And if you want to get a jump start on your travel hacking journey, be sure to check out our free webinar. We'll include a link to it in our show notes. Thanks so much for listening to the Travel Hacking Mom Show. Make sure to hit the subscribe or follow button from wherever you're listening so you never miss an episode. Want to start jet setting even faster? Follow the links in the show notes to learn about everything we discussed in today's episode. And to stay connected and follow along, follow us on Instagram at Travel Hacking Mom. We can't wait to see where in the world points and miles take you.